So, Namaste, good afternoon. Uh, okay, I'm L.S. Ganesh. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Management Studies of IIT Madras. And uh, uh, I think my uh, sharing of this uh, presentation would be a little different in terms of the technological content. It might be more from the socio-economic aspect. Okay? Uh, when we talk of inclusive manufacturing, I'm trying to share a case that India need a, needs a different philosophy, okay? Because we have to uh, uh, understand what's happening already on the field. Okay? So there are four parts, and I'll go through that uh, very fast. And of course, I've used the exhibits from the McKinsey report, which was released recently, A Future That Works, Automation, Employment, and Productivity. Now, first is the case, a justification for inclusive manufacturing basically on human rights and dignity. I'm not going to read the quotes. Anyway, the slides will be made available. But only one thing, I just wanted to uh, share the center one. Work is more than just a job, it's a reflection of our human dignity. I'm very happy that uh, even the earlier speaker talked of, uh, the person who talked about the Jaipur foot also mentioned about dignity as the center of what we're trying to do. Okay. That's another interesting quote attributed to Einstein. It has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to read everything, but uh, I'll read this from Susan Brooks um, on her work, Progressive Fundamentals of the Dignity of Work, the last part. Society thus has both a practical and a moral obligation to promote economic systems that allow for the widest possible expression of human potential through work. Now that's the starting point and I'm trying to show you data but actually we moved very far away from this and that's the reason I'm making this presentation. Okay. The principles, the second part, the principles of inclusive manufacturing, you can see that. The workforce needs to be a mix of all that and even more, that's just a list. And uh, the problem as you will perceive very shortly is that we now have to talk of inclusive manufacturing even to the mainstream population which is a very strange uh, paradox that we are facing right now. Okay. You can see that studies show that diversity and inclusion efforts are key drivers of innovation and critical to company success. It's not just company success, even community success, as you would have easily observed from some of the earlier presentations. Okay. They're also crucial for companies and communities that want to attract and retain top talent. Now, what is that? The third part, what are the implications of technology and automation? Some global macro level trends. Now, this is where the story starts. You know, why India needs a different philosophy of manufacturing. Okay. So you can see the first one is interesting. Technology has repeatedly brought about painful upheavals for workers in industrial society. Not a very old one, Moki Rayal, 2015, The History of Technological Anxiety. It's a nice paper. A journal of Economic Perspectives. Yeah. And you can see almost half the activities people are paid almost $16 trillion in wages to do in the global economy have the potential to be automated. So you know what scale we are talking about right now. Okay? It's a very, very, very large scale. In fact, the McKinsey report, the very recent one, is a good report because it talks of going down to activity levels and process levels, which also I will show, which is interesting. Okay? That's the first exhibit. You can see from that exhibit that uh, if you see the graph, on the left-hand side, you have the percentage that can be automated. On the right-hand side is the, uh, is the, I think, is the year. Sorry, one sec. Good. The percentage of roles that can be automated. And you can see some of them. Uh, uh, if you see the slide, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. You can't read everything. But once it gets to you, you can easily see on the left-hand side, you see the gray shaded column. It actually identifies specific occupations that are, that are ready for automation and to certain extents. And you can see the conclusion. While less than 5% of all occupations can be automated entirely using demonstrated technologies, about 60% of all occupations have at least 30% of constituent activities that could be automated. On the right-hand side, the pie chart actually talks of wage-wise distribution and labor-wise distribution in terms of extent of automation, and it shows India's position also. It's actually USA, China, India, and other countries. So India is a big player, so we have to really worry about this whole aspect. Okay. 
that's also uh, giving us reasons as to why um, automation is happening. Five factors affecting pace and extent of automation. You can see technological feasibility, cost of developing and deploying solutions, so on. The graph is interesting because it shows years on the x-axis and the automation potential on the y-axis. And you can see what happens when certain scenarios uh, reveal themselves, you know, and that's what it shows. This is very interesting. It says, how do we assess technological potential or technical potential of automation? And the analysis centered around 2,000 distinct work activities, which have been studied. In fact, this is a point I'm going to make. I'm not aware of this kind of a work in our country. That's one reason I'm trying to share. Of such a large scale, where we really drill down into activity level and see where automation should take place, where automation perhaps should be questioned. And that's interesting. It starts with retail, food and beverage service teachers, health practitioners, about 800 occupations. And the second column, activities, you can see that uh, greet customers, answer questions about products and services, clean and maintain work areas, and so on. 2,000 activities. And capability requirements on the right-hand side. Okay? So now that's how one analyzes in a drill-down way as to where automation can take place. And you can see this data. From 93 to 2000, every 1,000 industrial workers were substituted by one industrial robo in the US, mostly in the Midwest, I mean, what's called the rust states, or that's, that's what the paper says, and uh, 1.6 robos on an average in Western Europe. Okay? So that's international data. And uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, predicts that by 2025, up to a quarter of jobs will be replaced by either smart software or robos. Incidentally, I want to point out that even in the ITES sector in India, it's already happening big time. Okay? The automation of human response is already happening. I'm sure some of you would have tried calling one of those 800 numbers, and it would have been at least 10 to 12 iterations before you hear a human voice. I hope I'm not wrong in that. Okay? You'll always say, press this for this, press that for that, and it really takes you on a spin. You know? I'll, I'll, just skip through some of these slides. Yeah, that one is important. Mark Muro. The collapse of labor-intensive commodity manufacturing in recent decades and the expansion in this decade of super-productive advanced manufacturing have left millions of working-class white people feeling abandoned, irrelevant, and angry. In fact, this paper also explains why uh, Donald Trump won the elections, actually. That's also an interesting one. Currently, there are just about 1.75 robots for every 1,000 workers. And uh, this talks about jobs permanently lost due to automation, but uh, what is likely to happen, and so on. Okay. This talks about China and India. The next one, Martin Ford. It's a very popular book, The Rise of the Robots. Advances in automation technology will threaten a lot of blue-collar jobs. And the visual perception, spatial competition, and dexterity of robots, for instance, is improving rapidly, and so on. And uh, it comes to this, uh, it has set, uh, China has set national goals of producing 100,000 industrial robots a year and having 150 robots in operation for every 10,000 employees. So that's interesting. Now, that's a graph about which category of work activities have higher technical automation potential. Okay? So you can see the rightmost extreme, collect data, process data, and physical predictable jobs. Okay? I'll skip through some of this, and uh, yeah, this is interesting. The second part, building on 2013 research by Frey and all, which was published in 2015, a substantial share of jobs are at high risk of automation in major emerging economies, including China and India. 77% in China and 69% in India. And uh, we have to couple this with some other facts, which I'll share uh, off the uh, off the slides. Okay. Now. The, the penultimate part, implications of technology and automation, the macro level seen in India. We all know, in fact, it's very interesting. I've been looking at this data for about two and a half, three years. And one of the very proud observations I can make as an Indian is India, for all practical purposes, is number one in agriculture for several years in the world. You can look at the data. All you have to do is go to Wikipedia and say India rankings, and you'll get the pleasant surprise on your screen. We are literally number one, 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 two, one, one, five, seven, one, three. You know, that's the kind of ranking on raw, non-value-added agricultural products. We have to be very clear about this. Okay? 
because the value addition game we are yet to really scale up we are not doing very well but the problem is it's balanced on the other side that we are very poor on the world hunger index our rank is 91 out of about 130 countries and apparently we are in the bottom 10 in terms of the malnutrition index so in terms of quantity and quality of food that the best producer of food is enjoying it's a very big paradox okay it's a real paradox okay. and you can see this the new government's focus on manufacturing is also aimed at giving employment to millions of youth i'm going to give you data uh, from a very interesting article that i got from kancharamani very recently i'll quote that also why it's going to be a problem because the government has stated 100 million jobs and we are just about nudging 8 million jobs so we're just too far away from what we are trying to do i agree it's good to dream but you can't stay in a dream right <laughs> so that's about how the these are our reports a share of production wages as well as workers how it's coming down especially in low skill jobs and so on okay and in fact, the textile, this is known already because there have been a number of articles even over the last three, four decades about how automation in the textile se sector has, for all practical purposes, you know, decimated the, the textile community in the country. You know, the, some of the estimates are as high as two million households uh, uh, going into very bad circumstances because of heavy automation in the industry. This brings us to why the philosophy, because in production management, we talk of variety and volume, you know, and of course frequency also, but I'll stick to variety and volume. I really wonder whether our philosophy should be when we have very large variety and very large volume, whether our philosophy should be automation. It's a, it's a question that we have to ask, you know. So you can see from a high of 40 workers to produce one crore turnover, it's now declined to 25 workers. And of course, labor productivity statistics will obviously show uh, the green signal. Because you have reduced your labor force and your productivity, production is up and you'll say labor productivity is up, which is a false call, you know. You can see that a quarter of the people losing jobs because of automation by 2021 will be from India. Okay. That's also from a report. I'm not wanting to go into the Raymond case. Yeah, this is a nice statement. It's a, it's a statement which is a political statement. You can see the last sentence in the top part. The class struggles of the future are therefore anticipated to be artificial intelligence versus human beings, redefining the very notions of, the, of class conflict and industrial relations. Yeah. We don't know, but this is, a, this is some, somebody you know, thinking about this idea and, and talking of a possibility. Okay. Yeah, this is the statement I wanted to make. That's all great news. This is Mansuramani's paper, 2016. It's all great news for India, but it may not create the jobs Modi needs to achieve his goal. The outlook for Make in India campaign is not as rosy as recent investments suggest. The country only created 4 million manufacturing jobs between 2010 and 2014. By the way, all this data is Government of India data. It's not somebody's private data. Okay. And uh, at that rate of growth, the sector would produce only 8 million more jobs by 2022, far below the government's target of 100 million. It is nothing to do with the party in power or the government. We're talking of uh, a reality. Anybody would have faced the same thing. You can replace Modi by X and still have the same situation if the policy continued. So it has nothing to do with the person as such. It's not fair to, you know, labor on the person. And uh, the future of global manufacturing is clear. More robots, fewer workers. And this means a huge pool of low-cost labor is no longer a competitive advantage in development. Manufacturing may never again be the job creation engine it once was. The reality, that's, I like that sentence very much. The reality is that productivity enhancing technologies allow economies to produce more with less. But India needs to produce more with more. And that, I think, is our challenge. Now. Coming to the close of what I want to share with you, I've given some data here. And... Uh, Those are the, that's my last uh, uh, two slides. What are the implications for promoting inclusive manufacturing? Please recall the statement I made. 
Today, when we talk of inclusive manufacturing, we are in a very difficult state. We are talking of inclusive manufacturing that includes a large section of mainstream human beings. I'm not even talking of the disadvantage. Of course, that doesn't mean disadvantage should remain disadvantage. That will be a wrong statement ethically. I'm just saying we do have a serious problem on our hands. What I wanted to add beyond the slides is, I have data from AICTE that on the average, we are about close to a million BE, BTEC or equivalent graduates every year. Every year. In fact, our average a few years ago touched 1.4 million. It's just that now the enrollments are coming down because engineering seems to be losing uh, some of its sheen, you know. So, but that's very, I come from the state with the largest number of engineering colleges, you know, Tamil Nadu. And you know, people are now selling it for resorts and colleges are going a begging now. You know? But that's a serious challenge. I just wanted to share those figures because all of us know it's common sense. There's no way our country can absorb that workforce. And according to some reports, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, people coming with an undergraduate qualification, BA, BSc, BCom, etc., it's about 12 million. And if you look at people beyond the eighth standard, it's 20 million every year. Now, where on earth are we going to absorb all these people? This is a serious common sense question. It's very nice because we are all sitting in our own cocoons every day. And we don't see the harsh reality outside, the, outside of us. So that's, I, I would dare say in this forum, almost true, we are perhaps sitting on a social time bomb. You know, and it's high time we, we perk up. You know. The last one, it's idealism, all right. But I believe that ideals remain ideals because we fear practicing them. That's the problem. I think we have to foster an intellectual culture founded on transparency, trust, teamwork, truth, tolerance, and tenacity. I, I used all the words with tea because we are closer to tea time. <laughs> just for humor. These are, some, these are some plots I just show you. It's very interesting, just a few seconds, sir. Uh, this plot actually shows about how uh, different areas on the, on, the, on the columns, you have different types of work. And uh, here you have the industries and sectors. And they show how much of automation is potentially possible in each one of those in each one of those sectors for various types of jobs. You know, this kind of mapping is what I said. We ought to do this mapping. We have not done this mapping. Because we, we really seem to fear the details, you know. And we know God lives in the details. Perhaps we fear God. You know? So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of stuff. That's it. Okay. Shall I close with this? Last three sentences. So hither from hither. A little, little rhyme. Industry 4.0. You have to go to Siemens and Germany and you'll understand what is Industry 4.0. It's, I can tell you, to me, it's, it's out of this world. It's, it's even beyond science fiction, if you ask me. Okay? Industry 4.0. Sustainable in India. The last sentence. Thank you very much. The choices we must make are staring at us. Let's at least not dither. Thank you very much.